Well, let's get the views now of the last Labour leader uh, to win elections, the thrice elected uh, Prime Minister Tony Blair. Welcome to you. Who did you vote for uh, last week? I voted Labour. I said I was going to, and I did, although without any great enthusiasm, frankly, but I did. What, what do you say to people like Alistair Campbell who voted for the Lib Dems? I say I understand why you did what you did. Uh, he wouldn't be the only person I, I know who had voted Labour all their lives that didn't vote Labour in this, this election. Now, what should the Labour Party do? Because obviously its vote has been crushed, as Tamara says, it's been <coughs> losing votes in both directions. Yeah, it should stop equivocating, basically, and come out to a clear position. But, and that position, in my view, should be in, in favour of going back to the people. But it should do so after we go through a proper process uh, in Parliament. And this is part of the problem, which is that people, people are looking for a compromise on Brexit. Because if, if you're a responsible politician, you're looking at the country, what do these results tell you? Well, you can argue about the Brexit party coming number one, but then if you stack up the votes of the pro-Remain parties, it's a bigger percentage vote than the Brexit party and UKIP. So what these results really tell you is the country's profoundly divided. So what people look for is a compromise over Brexit. Unfortunately, that's not possible. You can get a compromise over the right process to reach a final decision, I think, even though that will be very difficult. But there is no Brexit compromise, because the one compromise that would make sense, which is a soft Brexit, in other words, Britain stays in the trading system of the European Union, even if it leaves the political system, that's a compromise that just doesn't work, because those people who voted for Nigel Farage and voted for Brexit want out of that trading system. That is integral well, to I mean, their, their, their point, and I think you'd probably agree with this, is that we'd be leaving, but we'd still be subject to European Union laws, which they Correct. don't want. Right. And because, of course, Brexit is based essentially on a myth, which is that we're not in control of our own laws, when we obviously are for the vast bulk of what this country needs to do for its future, the, the Brexiteers have been driven to focus on the single market and the customs union as the things that destroy our sovereignty, even though, by the way, it was a Conservative Party yeah. that first initiated these things. So it, it's, you're in a situation, therefore, that the compromise people seek over Brexit, which is a soft Brexit, i.e. you stay in a relationship this is rather like, like Norway. Stephen Kinnock and yeah. Lisa Nanny The problem Lange. is it comes from a very well-intentioned place. I completely get why people want to do it. But if you're... A Labour Party politician, you're worried you're hemorrhaging votes to the Brexit party because you've not been clear about Brexit, and you come out with a soft Brexit that the Brexiteers say is a betrayal, you're going to be no better off. In fact, you're going to be worse off because you'll have alienated the people who want to remain from the Labour Party, but you won't have given those people in these traditional working class mm. Labour seats who have voted Brexit, you won't have given them a reason for coming back yeah, to Yeah, but Labour. you see, that's the problem because uh, suppose Labour moves in the direction of... Uh, openly backing another referendum, it loses Bolsover, it loses Mansfield, it loses all those constituencies, it, it loses Gloria de Pietro's constituencies. Right, so that's the Nottingham. challenge. So what, what would I do if I was... Yeah. <laughs> right. It's to realise that there isn't a Brexit compromise and you've got to do two things. There's, there's one of two ways of resolving this. There's a sensible way and then there's a not-so-sensible way. I fear we'll go in the not-so-sensible way and let me come to that in a minute. The sensible way is to do what so far has not happened in Parliament, which is you lay out the options for people, hard Brexit, soft Brexit, no deal Brexit, you explain those options, you force Parliament to come to a decision, and it's at that point that, in my view, Parliament will realise the sensible thing is to decide on a form of Brexit but give the final say to the people. Because your hard Brexit is going to be extremely painful economically and your soft Brexit will be pointless. But what you're saying effectively is you think the choice is between effectively a no-deal Brexit and remaining. I mean, that's really, yes. what, that's really what it comes yes, down to. Yes, because otherwise, yeah. if, if the whole case of Brexit is get out of the single yeah. market and customs union, yeah. there's no point in doing right. a Brexit that the people who advocate Brexit say isn't a proper Brexit. So do you think that's what Mr Corbyn should do now, say that the Labour Party wants a referendum on basically absolute leave or absolute remain? I think he should do that, but I think if he's sensible, he will advocate a path in Parliament first that educates both Parliament and the British people that the reason why Parliament has been stalling over this is not because Parliament's a bunch of ne'er-do-wells who just want to thwart the will of the people. It's because there are different forms of Brexit with hugely different consequences. And you have to choose a form of Brexit. And therefore, one of the reasons why it's so important to go back to the people for a final say is after three years 
of this mess and a decision of this magnitude, it makes perfect sense to say, look, do you want to tell them again or do you want to think and again? And is this preferable to having a general election? Yes, a general election. Look, the Conservatives, what, what Jeremy Hunt's saying uh, there is absolutely right. The Conservatives would be... I mean, look, this is modern politics, but they would be certifiably insane to do a general election in the shadow of Brexit. So I think the less sensible route to a solution, which is what I fear we will do, is you'll have a new Tory leader. This Tory leadership competition is going to be a competition in Brexitness. Who can be more Brexit than the, the other person? And I think all of those Tory leadership candidates, whoever emerges, will go back to Europe. They'll try and essentially, if you read what they're saying, they're still trying to... to, to pitch this idea that Europe is going to allow us access into the market without abiding by the rules, they will find Europe says no to that and Europe will not make concessions to a hardline Tory leader that they were not prepared to give to Theresa May. You'll then have a situation where no deal is on the table. But here is my prediction. There is no Tory leader that would be crazy enough to try and tip this country into no deal Brexit without going back to the people. So you don't believe them, what they're saying now in their leadership campaign? I mean, oh, I believe they're prepared to advocate. Day or uh, Boris Johnson? They, someone like Boris Johnson, perfectly prepared to advocate no deal. But you cannot possibly argue that the June 2016 referendum is a mandate for no deal. These guys said at the time, if you remember, that the deal was going to be easy. They said, you know, the, the Germans would be queuing up to give us what we wanted. So... I don't think any of them, because, you know, if you're a Tory leader and you really want to own no deal for the Tory yeah. party, I right. mean, one of the things that amazes me is how the Conservative Party, that when I was growing up used to be the sort of common sense party, if you like, has now become literally this sort of Farage's grouping. I mean, it's a, for the Tories to put themselves in the position of that narrow nationalistic viewpoint is an extraordinary thing for them to do. But if we come down to this referendum which you're advocating, there is a chance, isn't there, that, that people out of patriotism, national pride, say, well, so be it, let's get rid of the European yeah, Union. There's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a chance of that. How of likely do you think that is? I don't think it's likely. I think if you mount a proper campaign and put the arguments in the proper way, you will bust apart the essence of the Brexit case, which is that we're not a sovereign country, when we obviously are. But you see, that's the, that's the problem there. You might have mounted a proper campaign, but we haven't had a proper campaign. Uh, Mrs May, Jeremy Corbyn, they didn't do interviews, they didn't debate each other, they didn't uh, go on the public stage during uh, this uh, recent election campaign and, frankly, in previous elections. I mean, that's what, that's what the country lacks, isn't it, is leadership. Yeah. It, it, absolutely, it's what it lacks. And I think if there is a, a new campaign, you will find that, that it's a much more equal type of campaign, because the arguments of the Farages of this world are going to be answered well, properly. Well, who, who is the person to take on Nigel Farage? It's not, it's not, I don't think there's one person that takes him on, as it were, but I think that anybody who gets into this campaign with the right set of arguments is going to find, you know, they can have the argument in the right way. Look, if you think of the challenges facing this country on the health service or um, taxes or public spending, living standards, um, inequality, uh, yeah. climate, you know, any of these challenges, yeah. Brexit is not the answer to any of them. The answers are to be found yeah. here in this country. But you see, the problem is, is that you know, Nigel Farage is probably the most persuasive communicator around, and unless he's taken head on, he, yeah. might, he, he might win the other way. Well, he will have to be taken head on, but he will be. And who will do it? Well, I think a range of people will do it, but... Well, you give know. us some names, because I'm, uh, I'm scratching <laughs> I'm not, my head. I know it's like choosing the names now, because I think it would be uh, yeah. difficult and invidious, but, look, in the end, if you have a fresh campaign, I think it will allow us, in the light of three years of experience, to go back into this argument. And, by the way, when people say, well, isn't there a risk that then people will, will vote oh. for a hard Brexit or no-deal Brexit, oh. I'm afraid if that is honestly what yeah. the British people want, with all the information they now have after the last three years, we're going to have to make the best of it. But then, then you can take the Kenneth Clark argument, and, and he just says, look, the problem is referenda, that, that our relationship with Europe is a complicated technical matter, should be handled by the people, and we don't want to go back and ask the people again, look what happened last time, would be his answer. Yeah, I, I get that 100%, but here's the problem, Ken. We had a referendum. Now, I was, I think, the one person who made a speech in the 2015 election saying, do not have a referendum on Europe. It's the wrong issue yeah. to try you and resolve. You started it, though. I mean, you, promi <laughs> you promised referendums on uh, other various European treaties. I promised with some... Um, I had to be persuaded yeah, somewhat. Fault, but, I mean. <laughs> yeah, of course, but... Uh, 
No, I was for a referendum if we joined the single currency. I think if you're a government that proposes a change, a huge change in the status quo, I think there is a case for having a referendum. I think what there is not a case for doing is having a, a, a referendum on the status quo when you, the government, actually want to keep the status quo. That's an incredibly dangerous thing to do because it lands you in the situation where we, we have been landed in, where you as a government are then forced to deliver something you profoundly don't believe in. What do you think of Mrs May? What are your feelings for her? So I feel very sorry for her on a, on a personal level. Um, and, you know, I know how difficult the job is. So personally, I'm deeply sympathetic mm. and I wish her nothing but good luck in the future. But obviously, I don't agree yeah, with I her. Mean, I mean, we're, she rebuffed you. I mean, you offered to meet with her and talk to her and she, she didn't want to do that. I mean, is that right? Well, we did actually have a conversation. but And I honestly think she... She tried to do the best for the country. But in the end, the problem with this Brexit business is that it, it's, it's a binary choice. And this is the difficulty. And I, I, as I say, I completely understand why people think, well, isn't there some way we can keep everyone united and on side with each other? I'm afraid it's such a destiny changing decision that the answer to that is no. You can maybe unite people around a process for reaching the decision, which is why I think if you did this in the way I describe, a proper process which we've not had yet in Parliament, and then a decision by the people, you might get to greater unity, but you're not going to find a compromise on Brexit itself. And, and you know, as I have tried to explain to her and to, to others, in the end, the choices on Brexit, you know, one is a suit and one is a dress, and you can have bespoke versions of both, but they're different. You know Boris Johnson, uh, you come across him as a journalist and, and, and various things. Is, is he someone who is fit to be Prime Minister? I know you don't agree with his politics. Look, I wouldn't vote for Boris Johnson as Prime Minister, that's pretty obvious. You know, I'm not going to get into fit or not fit, that's a pretty heavy thing to say about someone. Which has been raised by candidates like yeah. Rory Stewart. Yeah, but you know, in the end, that's a Tory leadership campaign, they can have their leadership campaign. My worry is less about Boris Johnson than that the position that he represents. And that position is a position where, and this is the fundamental problem with these Brexit people, they are uniting two groups of people to get Brexit who fundamentally disagree with each other. One group of people like my, some of my former constituents who actually worry about globalization, worry about things like immigration and want to halt to the way the world is going. The other people like Boris Johnson are ultra Thatcherites. And they put these two bits of this coalition together. And the real danger, if we, if we do Brexit, is that you're going to get to the situation where if you tumble out of Europe, for example, with a hard Brexit or no deal Brexit, Boris Johnson's going to be wanting to go in the direction of deregulation, lower taxes, smaller state. And the foot soldiers that delivered Brexit are going to be going in precisely the opposite direction. It's one of the reasons why, you know, if you get to another referendum, it's going to be a very simple argument. Do you want to carry on arguing about Brexit for years to come, or do you want to switch out of this complete diversion from the real challenges of the country and get back to facing those challenges and dealing with them? If uh, the Tories make a mess of it, Brexit's unresolved and we have a general election, do you think Jeremy Corbyn would win it? I think it all depends whether it happens in the shadow of Brexit. If Brexit's an, an issue at the next election, the Tories are at risk. If it's not, then obviously they're in a stronger position. But at risk from Jeremy Corbyn as he stands now? Well, the, yeah, it's a whole other topic. But um, look, it's no secret I don't agree with the direction the Labour Party's gone in under Jeremy Corbyn. But I think if Brexit is unresolved and you have a general election, then the risk for the Tories is the risk they ran in 2017 and then more so. And the risk for Labour? The risk for Labour is if it doesn't put forward a set of policies that can command support in the centre as well as on the left, then it can't get to a majority. And that is essentially on Europe. I mean, Mr Corbyn's got to move on Europe. Well, I think on Europe, he's just got to come to a clear position. I mean, the one thing that's, the one thing that's very obvious is that both party leaderships have made the same mistake, which is to think that it's possible to sit on the fence on Europe and appeal to both sides. What the European elections show you is that isn't possible. I mean, he celebrated his 70th birthday at the weekend. I don't know if you sent him a card or not. <laughs> but, but, <laughs> Look, I tend, when people get to that stage, they probably don't want reminding. But All right, well, well, that's should, how I feel, uh, and I'm younger. Yeah, well, should, uh, is he the man to lead the Labour Party still? I mean, 
Look, there's questions about the leadership, but those are for another day, in my view. Why? I mean... Because I think the issue today is... is the issue today, frankly, is Brexit. Um, and, you know, all the concentration and all the energy um, has got to be to sorting out a Labour Party position that's sensible, that can command as much support as possible, that actually deals mm. argument by argument with the concerns of those moderate Labour MPs in Brexit voting yeah. seats who worry that if we come to a much more pro-European position, their seats will be lost. But, I mean, do you hold out much hope uh, in Tom Watson? I mean, after he was the man who did you in uh, as, as Prime Minister to a certain extent. Yeah, but, you know, politics moves on, and I, I never bear grudges in politics. I think Tom Watson's shown a lot of leadership in the last and, uh, year you... or so, and I, I support what he's trying to do within the Labour Party, uh, which is to give a you know, a broad shelter to those MPs that believe that Labour wins when it, when it wins from a centre-left position. And, you know, this is a, an you, unresolved you're, you're, debate. Are you talking to each other, you and Tom Watson? Yes, of course. I mean, I talk to a lot of Labour MPs. Um, and, you know, I talk to MPs across the political spectrum, actually. And, and one of the things that's very, very obvious is that quite apart from the issue of Brexit, there is a large centre ground in British politics today that's not represented. And, you know, if the Tory party really do go to being a, a, a sort of Brexit party, in other words, they think the way to defeat Nigel Farage is to ape him, if they really do that and the Labour Party stays in a far left position, then I've said, you know, on many occasions, you've got a vast yeah. amount of territory in British politics that's just open and empty. I mean, there is another analysis which is around today following the results of the European elections, which simply says the old red-blue politics are finished, that people now identify in different ways. They're more concerned about where they stand on Brexit than they are whether they support Labour or the Conservatives, and many people concerned about the environment, all, all, all the rest of it. You've talked about open and closed. I mean, do you think the Labour Party and the Conservative Party have outlived their usefulness? I don't... I think... I put it in a, in a different way. If they, if they retreat to ideological extremes of left and right, I think they will make themselves irrelevant mm. to the challenges of the future, but I think it's perfectly possible for either of those parties to recapture the basis upon which they won elections. But, I mean, it's happened across Europe in these elections. Yeah, it, so. it has, you're right. And, and if you look, it's, a, it's, you know, because the lesson of these European elections is, yes, you have had a certain populist surge, although not actually as much as people think. But you've had a move away from... Right, and you've had a, a big move forward. I mean, actually, the big winners in Europe have been the, the, those Liberals. Um, and Greens. So, yeah, no, I, I do think, I think what it shows you is people's traditional allegiance. You know, when I was growing up, there were people who would vote Labour no matter what, and there were people who vote Tory no matter what. It wouldn't matter who you put up, what the position of the party was, they would simply vote for the party, for the tribe. I think that party allegiance has weakened in today's world. I think the sociology of politics has shifted. And therefore, I think if the two main parties go off to the extremes, or they become just the guardians of the status quo in circumstances where people want change, then you will get new political groupings formed. The point I'm making to you is that the Tory party or the Labour party, it's open to them to go back to more yeah. sensible positions. It's just at the moment they don't show any signs of doing Bearing so. Bearing that in mind in their meeting today, the uh, present European leaders, uh, who should be the next EU presidents? Yeah, well, I've always taken the view that you should, you should, for the president of the commission, you should get the most competent person for the job. I don't think it matters. I, I think Manfred it, Weber doesn't exactly uh, inspire, does it? Well, you can, you can go through each of these candidates. The important thing is, I mean, all of these candidates are people that those who will make the decision, and after all, it's the leaders of sovereign nations who will make mm. those decisions. All of them have worked with all of these candidates. Um, actually, I think it's pretty good range of choice in those candidates. So they should choose the most capable person for the job. That's the sensible thing. Barnier? Okay. Well, he's one of the options. There's a, about four yeah. or five different candidates. And you know, he's a perfectly competent person. For the commission, you've got to have a competent executive. For the leadership of the council, then that's someone, I think, who can also speak for Europe and give some sense you think, of you think vision. Merkel might be interested in one of those jobs? Well, she has constantly said not, so I think you've got to assume that she isn't. And just final question, do you, you know, what, we don't know the answer to this question, but how do you feel? Do you think the UK is ever going to leave the European Union or not? I think, but, you know, you've got to aim off for the position I, I hold. I think it is more likely now 
uh, that we will have another referendum and more likely that therefore we will vote to stay in the European Union. But I think we live in an era of unique unpredictability and there are so many different variable factors before we reach that point. But I think the only way you're ever going to bring this country back together is through a reasonable process for deciding whether we really want to leave Europe or we want to, to stay. And then hopefully the emergence of a political coalition and a government that address the true challenges of the country, of which, by the way, as I constantly say, the forthcoming technological revolution is the single biggest challenge we face and no political party in this country is yet even addressing it. Tony Blair, thank you very much indeed.